Welcome to The Changing Rooms, a brand new podcast by The Ever Learner. The Changing Rooms is dedicated to sharing the best quality conversations possible in the domain of physical education. My name is James Sims and I am your host. I'm a PE teacher of 17 years experience, having worked in four different state secondary schools and one state FE provider, including over 10 years as a head of PE. I'm also the creator and founder of The Ever Learner, of Exam Simulator and of the brand new National Diagnostics Diagnostic Exams in PE. I'm also the host of the Teacher in Classroom 21 podcast, as well as the author of Education Reimagined, published in 2017. Series one of The Change Rooms will feature four episodes. I am delighted to welcome a brilliant colleague to be part of episode one. Meet Lee Sullivan. Lee is head of PE at Upton Court Grammar School, but he's very much more. Lee is different. He has recently published Is PE in Crisis Leading Meaningful Change in Physical Education? A book available via Scholarly and sold on Amazon and a book that is challenging some of the dominant, dominant assumptions in the PE sector. Lee is driven by the need for improvement, for modernization, transformation, one might say, and his writings as well as his day-to-day -day work are creating a stir in the world of PE teaching. More than anything, Lee is driven by his why. He is direct and honest in his PE in crisis. He raises difficult questions that every PE teacher has probably asked themselves and through his own why goes on to advocate a possible shift in what PE is and what it can be. At the heart of Lee's work and Lee's writing is the need for PE to meet the needs of all learners, not just the few. And he challenges the assumption that PE is a skill acquisition and performance obsessed subject. Whilst Lee does not call for wholesale throwing out of all that PE is and has been, he does call for real change in the sector and a new conversation about who and what we are. Most importantly, Lee urges every PE teacher to discover their why and to ensure that this is achieved in the service to all students. Lee, hello, thank you for being Hi, here and welcome to The Change Rooms. Appreciate it, it's a real honour, thank you very much. Absolutely, our pleasure. So Lee, let's dive straight into this. Um, 2020, 2021, during those lockdowns, we all remember them. Those of us that are mere mortals, me included, we built home offices, we watched Netflix to God knows what end, and we jogged around our gardens. You, Lee, researched and wrote a book, why? Firstly, I think you're probably giving me way too much credit there, James. I actually uh, spent most of my lockdown in this in this room delivering live lessons while trying my best to stop my uh, one-year-old and four-year-old from bursting in to those live lessons. So I think you're giving me too much credit. But yeah, I, I was able to, to, I guess, put pen to paper and start a project that I've been thinking about for some time. Um, probably, I think the whole process probably started about two years prior to uh, COVID, and it all stem from just a, a sheer frustration that I felt. Um, I was so much so that I, I genuinely nearly left the profession. I was struggling with this lack of impact that I felt I was having. A student voice was telling me that I was having a lack of impact. My, uh, I was seeing the same students for extracurricular PE. Uh, in lessons, just through observations, I could see the same students progressing and the same students kind of uh, move into the background not really wanting to get involved and I, I just you spoke about my why there and my why is to prepare all students for life through physical education and I'm really clear with that and I think it's important that every physical educator is but I wasn't meeting that why and <clears throat> it was almost like when just before Covid hit it was almost like a eureka moment that it just wasn't wasn't why I was a PE teacher and so through those frustrations and actually through a number of conversations I had whether it be on, on social media and Twitter or just through uh, our local uh, school sports network, I, I, I was hearing the same back. I was hearing the same back from other PE teachers that, that felt the same. And just to the, I, I was in a, a place where I thought I either leave or I change it. I do something about it. And, and most people that become a teacher, they, they want to become a teacher. You know, we're never going to be rich. We're never going to have those yachts etc but we really can make a difference and so I thought right let's give it a go Let, let's see what I can do and and so I, I did I, I I think that the biggest thing about one of my frustrations is not just the impact but I just knew sport or PE was just so much more than sport and I knew that sport was so much more than how we were using it in PE it was 
very sports driven, performance obsessed, technique focused. And that is just a, a, the tip of the iceberg of, of what sport can be. Um, and I, I guess what lockdown presented, I think Benjamin Franklin said it much better than I ever could, that um, out of adversity can, comes real opportunity. And, and it did provide me that opportunity. And I think it provided a lot of physical educators an opportunity to stop. We had to look at how, how we were delivering things and then try and change that. And, and that, that's pretty much, James, where, where it all started, that, that COVID gave me that opportunity to, to say, you're not happy with it. You haven't been happy with it for a while, either put up or shut up. And that, that's what I did. So I started reading and reading and reading and then putting down on paper my frustrations. And then from there, it just evolved. In, into, what was, what into, was the nature? When you say putting down on paper, Lee, what was the actual nature of that? Were you, were you writing a Word document? Were you scribbling down? What, where were you putting that to begin with? It was a bit of both. It started off just pen to paper, just writing down a list of frustrations. Mm. And then um, I thought, let, let's look at these further. What's the reasons for these frustrations? I started to add a bit more meat to the skeleton and then it went onto a Word document. And this simultaneously, the, the one, you know, COVID was awful for so many people, but the one thing it was able to do um, was put us in front of a computer with, I say no distractions, my, my one-year-old would, would definitely try to, to be a distraction, but it, it also, I was, I was networking with people from the other side of the world, international teachers. I was on webinar after webinar, yeah. just listening, just listening to the great work that so many people were doing around the world. And if it wasn't for that lockdown, I would never have had the opportunity to, to do that. So while I was writing down my frustrations, I was learning loads about my subject and I was really starting to, to put together, you know, being completely honest and full, full disclosure, I failed to deliver this concept curriculum that's out there now on PE Scholar is night and day compared to what it was when I first started it. And probably about six months maybe slightly more than that before lockdown I trialed a concept curriculum and it looks nothing like it does now but it the 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 reason for it was there I wanted to teach life skills through sport but the consistency wasn't I just and the model the, the application the pedagogy wasn't there yeah. um, and so I, I tried about two or three different versions and they all failed and it was lockdown that enabled me to read the work of Julie Stern uh, who's fantastic at conceptual learning, read the work of uh, Lynn Erickson, of, of uh, Liz Durden Myers and Margaret Whitehead around physical literacy, and really then start to, to delve down and say, right, I want to deliver life lessons. The biggest challenge I've got is how do I do that? The infinite learners were, were really pivotal. Will Sway was again really pivotal in, in directing my vision. I knew what I wanted. I just didn't know how I was I was going to do that. And that's what lockdown and the book, honestly, the book was probably really selfishly more for me than anybody else at that point. But that's so important that I, you say it's selfish, but like for me, it, it, it's almost an art form, isn't it? You're allowed to be selfish. Like you're producing something which ultimately is coming from your heart, from your core. And I think it actually has to be selfish in that sense. I have the same in my own work. I do it my way. And actually, you kind of have to accept the, the, the downside of that. Yeah, it, it was almost like I was forming my arguments. I was, I was um, all the, the, the research I was doing, the evidence I was compiling, whether it be statistical or evidential, whatever it was, you know, from, from education researchers or, you know, Youth Sport Trust research, Sport England. I, I was gathering that all together, almost forming my own argument as to why yeah. we need change. Yeah. And then from there, I was like, right, so now I, I know why we need change. I, I've known that for a while, that we need change. That, I, don't mean to I don't mean to interrupt you, but that is fascinating that you felt you had the intuition of it, that this wasn't, something wasn't right. Mm -hmm. And it's actually the research, your Whitehead, your Ericsson, your Sways, your Dodo, it's actually the, the reading around these guys that has then formulated that for you. I find that really interesting. I think, I think it's in, one, of, one of the issues and one of the reasons I think we've been quite resistant to change for a while is we've, physical educators have had quite a lot of pressure on us from the top we've got to yeah, uh, i agree demonstrate you know we've got to demonstrate progress through often through levels or gradings and it has to be the easiest way for that was often performance based mm -hmm. and 
we've been delivering it that way for a long time. And I think a lot of it has been outside pressure. We've been told to do it that way. But an another reason I think that's been quite difficult, and I, look, I can only speak for myself here, James, and I'm probably gonna sound like a bit of an idiot, but a lot of times accessing the research is difficult. Firstly, finding it is difficult. You've got websites doing a fantastic job. The Everland is doing a fantastic job of bridging that gap. P Scholars doing an outstanding job of bridging that gap between the evidence and, um, and practice. But there is that quite big gap between the research and the evidence and the practice. And I know as a head of PE, one, I don't, I don't have the time. I don't have the time to read every new piece of research and evidence that's out there. But two, it's one thing to read it, it's in a completely different thing to know how to apply that in your department, in your context. And I hope that in PE in crisis, if, you know, whatever you think of, of my book, I really hope that I've been able to at least get as much evidence as I can, condense it. And the reason I said that I, I, I might come across as a bit of an idiot is because sometimes I'm reading some of this research and it is just beyond me, above my head. Um, Whereas I really hope that this book is more, it's written by a, a head of department, a PE teacher, for PE teachers, hopefully in a, you know, front line, this is what we're delivering, this is how you might do it kind of language, as opposed to this, um, this kind of almost foreign language sometimes that, that is difficult to really understand and then apply, let alone apply. Well, I mean, that, that allows me to bring in the book. Yeah, I actually read this this week, as you know, Lee. And I just, as, before we came on, I told you, I, I read this in, in three sittings, which is really rare for me for, with a book. It takes me much longer normally. And I think the summary you've just made there is absolutely critical. You have brought together the tendrils of the research that matters in this particular topic. And not only have you presented it, summarised it, made it digestible, but you've also presented, let's call it a, a, a possible solution to those things, or at least Lee's solution to those things. And I think that is a great service to us. So really, I think you should be very proud of that, as I said before. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you this question, Lee. Um, you, you said quite early in the book, you, you made this statement, and it was that it is vital that PE teachers build positive attitudes towards sport and physical activity through the new research conducted for this book, however. Sorry, I'll do that again. Through the new research conducted for this book, however. I'll try again. Through the new research conducted for this book, however hard it is to hear, it is clear that this is not what we are doing. So that is a really hard hitting statement, I think, Lee. And I'm gonna ask you here, could you explain to PE teachers as well as school leaders what you meant by that statement? It's, it is hard to hear. It's yeah. hard to hear and it was really hard for me to take. And I think this was one of the reasons that I nearly kind of left is telling somebody that's been in education, whether you're getting in it now or you've been in it for a number of years, that what you the reason you've got into it for or the, the, what you've been doing for a number of years this is what i found difficult to take is what i've been doing for a number of years a subject that i fell in love with at school was potentially doing more harm than good and let, let me give you some context behind that so this this actually isn't in the book but i led a um a student voice i think when i was at my most frustrated i went around and, and i did a learning walk kind of off not, wasn't looking at any teachers I just wanted to hear from students so I went into the, the lessons were on at the time I just asked one question my question was why does PE exist at Upton Gort Grammar School that was my only question and I got <clears throat> I got the answers such as uh, well it's great to get out of the classroom and do some physical activity it's nice to relieve stress from the, the more academic subjects it's great to be around our friends we have fun with our friends now, in truth, none of those questions, none of those answers, sorry, are wrong. But I could have asked them, why does break time exist at Upton Court Grammar School and got exactly the same answers? It, it, was, no, it was no different. And uh, through the research I've been doing, and then that was hard hitting, that was really difficult because I poured my heart and soul into this you know, sport driven curriculum because this is how it's always been done and this is what PE is. And I would I planned my lessons extensively. I trained my staff up. I thought really well. We were gen, like we were inadvertently. I was finding out by the student voice. We were inadvertently, indirectly putting students up. We were doing more harm than good, and that was really hard for me to hear, and really hard for me to take and to reflect on. You know, I'm trying really hard. Why well, don't it was almost. 
I felt a little bit um, angry. Why aren't they getting it? Why, why are they not getting it? And it, it was only through listening to people, talking, reflection, loads of reflection, reading, um, uh, that I realised that actually this sport-driven approach, in fact, actually, to, to put it in a better way, um, Harris and Kale talk about fitness for life and fitness for performance. And there's, there's this really big difference between the two. And what we were focusing on in my, in my department through, um, because I was leading it that way, we were focusing on fitness for performance. Yeah. When actually my why, my team's why, um, and um, what needed to happen is we, were, we needed to focus on this idea of fitness for life. Take the learning from PE um, and you know it doesn't matter what subject you teach, you want the learning from your lesson to be transferred outside of your lesson. Exactly. You want it to be applied to life. And, you know, to, to further back up my argument as to, to for those people that, that felt maybe offended that I'm saying what you've been doing for so long isn't, isn't working. Um, and I realise that, you know, it's a controversial statement, but we just have to also look at these, although they're complex, although they're really complex issues, obesity is rising mental health, stress, body confidence are all hugely on the incline. Um, I think it was Sport England said 51% when they surveyed students, 51% strongly agreed to enjoying sport. That means 49% either agree or, or lower. So that, that's 50% of the people we are teaching uh, are saying that actually, you know, I, I don't mind sport or, or even worse, I don't like it. Um, we know for, for a while participation rates have been dropping post-16. Uh, so, so although they're all complex issues and we can't take the blame, sole, sole blame, I do think we need to reflect and say, but can we do things better? Can we? We're in a unique position in PE. Can we do more to support those issues? And I really genuinely think we can. And so, yes, it is hard-hitting, James. There's no doubt about it. It's hard-hitting, but... I love that point you just made. Like, I, I agree with you. The P sector is not solely responsible for, the, let's call it the malady that there is around obesity, mental health, activity levels of the dropout rate in teenagers. These are real issues that are societal issues, but you're right. PE is probably the one sector in society which has the most potential pivotal influence on that. And the question is, is it having the right influence? I think that's the way I would personally look at it. Now, that for me is, that's a reframe that leads to us as P teachers can be very excited about that if we get it right. Yeah. I completely agree. Let's uh, let's have a look at this. We, we, we've mentioned a couple of times here the, the concept curriculum, or you've mentioned it already. Lee. I really want to sort of drill down there. So having read it this week, the book, it's really the notion of the concept curriculum comes through very, very powerfully. And it's certainly central to your work. So so why is this concept curriculum so important, Lee? And why should P teachers know about it? Uh, I think for, for all the listeners right now, I want to I want to ask the question directly to them. Mm. Why? Why do you teach PE? Yeah. You, you could have done anything. You know, why is it you're teaching PE? Every time I've ever asked that question to any PE teacher, I've always heard very similar answers, always worded differently, but very similar answers. I'm passionate about sport. I'm passionate about physical activity. I want to get other students passionate about it. Um, you know, I've, I've shared mine to prepare students for life through physical education. I've never once heard a student, sorry, a teacher reply to me saying, I want to win the year 10 County Cup. I, I want to create an elite athlete. I've never heard that. And the truth is, most educators, uh, personally, if that is your answer, I think you're in the wrong profession. I agree. I think you should, you should be, probably be, be a coach. Be a coach elsewhere. Yeah. Um, so I want, I want people to consider why they're teaching PE. And then I want them to really reflect on is a sport driven and if you're one of those schools that are still teaching with a sport driven you know performance obsessed assessed uh, delivery then are is that meeting your why is that form of delivery meeting the reason you got into to be a physical educator and then i want you to kind of reflect on think of that the students that your current why and your current curriculum is meeting the needs of and then consider the 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 names of the students that it's not meeting the needs of. And feel free to ask the students, by the way, because they'll, they will absolutely tell you. But in my opinion, and I said this previously, sport is so much more 
than just skills, techniques, rules, competition. You, you know, th there's that old kind of, I don't know, I don't think this is true, but you know, there, there, there used to be this idea that we only use a certain percentage of the brain. Um, however, that's how I feel about a sport driven um, PE delivery. We're only using a really small percentage of the potential that PE ha a, a sport has. Sport is so much more, it's resilience, it's leadership, it's fellowship, it's winning and losing, it's teamwork. And, and, and honestly, I can, the list is endless. Sport is so, so powerful. The potential of sport is so powerful, but we haven't through that delivery been harnessing that power. And let, let me go back to some of the statistics I spoke of, that I spoke of previously. We know that obesity is rising. So for example, the U Sport Trust said that 33% of students have body, uh, body confidence issues. So why can't we in PE teach self-esteem and self-worth? We know that, and this, this statistic I found really alarming, 92% um, of students suffer from exam stress. So why can't through PE, through sport, through physical activity, why can't we teach coping skills, resilience, mental health units? Um, inactivity, childhood obesity is, is higher than ever. So why can't we teach things on diet, long-term benefits of exercise? Um, all of these things are really important. Social benefits of exercise as well as mental we, we can we also know that competition for jobs is as high than it's ever been so why can't we teach employability leadership communication interpersonal skills now some people would argue that we are doing that yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm arguing that we do it explicitly yeah so and, and that's and so for example changing the lesson objective to um you know students will be able to complete the layup shot by the end of this lesson or you know most students will be able to do it in a in a um a competitive drill or competitive environment whatever it is the truth is firstly i've never led a class this might just be me as a pe teacher uh, maybe it's saying something about more about my teaching than than the curriculum but i've never ever led a layup shot where every student's been able to do it so straight away i'm failing there then if if and Alan Dunstan, the infinite leaders, talks about this much better than I do. And the, the layup shot is never something a student's going to need in an interview. It's not, it's not a skill they're going to need later in life. But so through that, why don't we can still teach a layup shot? Sport is not lost. It is still valuable. It is still vital. It's just no longer the destination. It's now the, the vehicle for which we can deliver things like resilience. So... Um, I'm trying to keep, like, give you a specific example. And I think I said this actually on the launch event with, with PE Scholar, but I delivered a lesson. And I hope one of the reasons that the concept curriculum is powerful is that I've done it. I know that it works. I've got the student voice to back it up. This, and there's a, probably about 150 schools now worldwide that are delivering the concept curriculum. And the feedback is just brilliant. Well, that's a really interesting number. We, we, we actually did a measure in our own business recently, but we believe that there are something like sixteen to 17,000 total schools in what you might call the sort of the, the developed or Western world. We're talking as few as 150 that are, that are actually following this. So you're right, it's off the ground. Well, well Still in it in. they're delivering our, our version of it. There's many different approaches. And I think uh, somebody said the question the other day, you know, you, you're saying that your approach is the only way. I'm not. Mine is not the only way. There's many ways of delivering it. But what I'm challenging people, if you want to deliver mine, fantastic. I will, I will support you to do that. You just need to direct message me on Twitter and I'll absolutely support you. But there are so many other uh, approaches. Just what I'm saying is stop being sport specific. And honestly, so sport specific, you're going to have your 10% via Sport England, they're, they're under the skin research, says 10% are sports enthusiasts. So the, the rest of the 90%, the 10% the are going to love it. In fact, actually, they'd probably love it no matter what you did. Yeah. They just love sport. The rest of the students, that learning isn't relevant. That learning isn't meaningful. They're going in thinking, I'm never going to use this skill. Um, it means nothing to me. I can't do it now. I'm not going to be able to do it at the end of the lesson. What's the point? Whereas if we delivered a unit around self-worth and that unit incorporated nine lessons, which gave each kid an individual lesson on the tools to what self-worth is and how to, to obtain it, if you like, then that is relevant for every kid. Every single student's gonna need resilience. Every single student's gonna need to, at some point in their life, is gonna come under some stress. 
So if we can teach um, coping skills through sport, through physical education, that is relevant and meaningful learning for every single student, mm -hmm. not just, you know, we're doing a layup shot today that, uh, you know, those five out of this entire year group that are going to play for our school are going to need. This is relevant and meaningful learning for every single student. And I'm, I'm so passionate about it, James. That this uh, it's literally the word I was about to use back to you, Lee, which is the passion you have for this is, is flowing from you. I really would give you that, that piece of feedback. A, a couple of things I'd like to pick up on as well. First of all, you're clearly saying here, we do not lose sport. We do not lose our badminton or our trampolining or our football. It's the vehicle we are using to develop these concepts. I think if I understand you correctly, Lee, that's what we do. The other thing that I think we've got, to, I want to come back to the, the under the skin research that you mentioned. You actually, through the book, you made me go and read the whole thing. I've read that this week as well, because I hadn't read it worryingly. So I went and read that. And one of the things that I thought was most fascinating about your book, Lee, is that you you said those sports enthusiasts, which I think as you said, we're about 10% of students. It's those sports enthusiasts who are probably not only the students that are succeeding in our current sports model, but they're also probably the students that are going on to be the PE teachers and then recycling that model again and again. And that's obviously part of the challenge. I completely, I'm a sports enthusiast. Yeah, me too. There's no doubt about it. I, I'm, I love my sport. I'm passionate about sport. If I'm not, um, you know, watching it, I'm, I'm trying to play it. or I'm So I, I I think people think that I'm trying to eliminate competition. I'm trying to move away from sport. Um, one, one person actually tweeted me the other day saying, oh, this guy will be taking away sports day from us next. Um, of which my response was, if your sports day is, is relevant and meaningful and it meets the needs of every student, then crack on. But I'm not trying to do that. I, I'm saying sport, if you just deliver the skills and the techniques and the rules, you're, you're just, you're the, one, you're not meeting the needs of every learner, but you're just, it's the tip of the iceberg of the potential that the power that sport has. Um, and, and that's all I'm saying. So, so we still deliver. Um, so this week alone, we're still delivering um, to our year sevens. They're doing the value for PE uh, uh, unit of work. We've got teachers that are delivering that through basketball and through netball and through football. They're delivering this. The sport is just the vehicle. And, um, yeah, it takes a little bit of planning. It takes a little bit of, of knowing your sport and thinking, right, does that concept work with that one? So, for example, I changed our basketball scheme of work recently to teach resilience because in the resilience unit of work, we talk about marginal gains and we look at embracing failure. Now, it makes sense that I teach marginal gains with dribbling um, because it, there's very simple marginal gains, you know, using your fingertips, keeping the ball waist high, looking up, um, shielding the ball from the opponent. They're tiny little things they're marginal gains that you can incorporate into that, that skill. Um, and then, so then I taught embracing failure with the layup shot, because actually most students will fail yeah, repeatedly yeah. with a layup shot. Yeah. And that just highlights my point even, you know, it, it highlights the concept even further. I think it's important as well for teachers to, to shift the mindset. We can still coach. We can still give feedback. The most able students aren't going to be lost in this. We can still give them and challenge them the feedback. And if, if the most able student in your class isn't challenged in your lesson, it's not because of the concept. Yeah, I agree. So, so, so uh, you know, I'm trying to debunk a lot of misconceptions about the concept curriculum, but um, sport is absolutely in no way lost. It is as important as it's ever been. It's just no longer the final judgment. It's no longer the final destination. It's just a vehicle for that learning. I, and I loved how you started this, the answer to this question as well, Lee, because you talked, you used that metaphor of that, that old myth that we only use whatever is 5% of our brain power. I love I that. Know true, James, I don't yeah, know. I don't know if it's true either, but, but the same applies here, right? We are, we are effectively, we're mm -hmm. utilising sport in a very marginal way in, in and of itself, and it's got so much more potential. And I also love the fact that if we move towards the kind of model that you're talking about we also elevate the position of the subject as a whole across across the school across the community across the sector across the society and that's something i think those PE teachers we all feel what why do we feel a bit maligned at times maybe we're starting to uncover some of the reasons for that as well yeah I, look you, you mentioned it previously about those sports enthusiasts become them becoming teachers etc yeah. that's not a bad thing sports no, enthusiasts can be a fantastic PE teacher i'm a sports sure. enthusiast and I, you know a lot of people that I know that are PE teachers, fantastic teachers, sport enthusiasts, but those same people, those the, the 90%, and some of those 90% are, are, you know, the op I get turned on by competition, it's what drives me. There are people that are actively turned off by competition. 
and and some of those people that are now leading uh, senior leaders etc they're probably thinking they're seeing the same sport driven exactly. delivery that they had when they were at school and therefore they didn't value it when they were at school they're certainly not going to value the same delivery now so that's why I think that's one of the reasons there are many reasons but that's one of the reasons I think as well that we are seeing physical education being taken off certain timetables for more for more academic subjects yeah that's in my eyes one of the reasons um but uh, no absolutely C completely agree with you mate Let, let's chat about fiscal literacy lee i mean it, it, it's it, you clearly believe that widespread understanding of physical literacy is really essential here and it's essential to everything that you've written about um why do you believe this and how widespread does physical literacy as a concept need to actually reach are we talking about it being understood by every PE teacher by every PE student are we talking about every teacher in a school are we talking about every uh, every parent every society member what, what what's your vision for this yeah I think that's a, a good a really good question James I think it needs to be so I, I say this sometimes I say it off the record actually to some of my students that PE is more important physical literacy is more important for you to understand than literacy um and um I'm aware that there'll be some English teachers you know uh, upset about that but I spend a good half an hour of my evening every evening with my now five-year-old reading there's a lot of emphasis on parents to to ensure that their, that their kids are reading because they know how important literacy is for accessing lessons and, and life and of course it is but physical literacy and this understanding of building meaningful um, experiences of PE we know that physical literacy involves competence and confidence knowledge and understanding and I think that's all really from in my opinion is underpinned by this motivation to yeah. want to get in and if we hinder that motivation by delivering a, a bad experience then we're knocking potential opportunities for that person's for lifelong engagement for me physical literacy is um is is the core principle that could bring our profession together wow. it's the it's the it's the physical literacy will win over the hearts and minds of of everyone um that that currently doesn't value pe or even if they do just physical literacy is is vital to understand if we can get the experiences in pe right and really nurture physical literacy then we will see the knock-on effect of that for years for mm -hmm. years to come read the work of mark Brock whitehead and and in my even if you don't have time to do that read my book it's a lot of it i, I try and summarize well, it well, well i'm going to say that that it, for me i consider myself well read in pe and that brought to me numerous aspects of the book brought to my attention things i hadn't considered i hadn't read it, and p teachers do need to read this so sorry to jump in there Lee. no not, not not at all liz durden myers is a guru on physical literacy have a her PE scholar website has got a, just a really a summarized book on physical literacy and i if you're a physical educator i really recommend just having a little look she also tells you how to apply it but if, if you i think as at the very minimum physical educators need to understand physical literacy and the impacts yeah. of uh, bad experiences in PE that can have on physical literacy. But I, it needs to be widespread. It needs to be as important to SLT, as important to parents, as important to our, ourselves as literacy. You know, we, we ensure that we continue to read because we want to read to our students and get them a love of reading. We've got to do the same with, with physical activity with all due respect to maths and you know it's an important subject without a doubt if in if in in maths we give them bad experiences we inadvertently tell them that they're not very good at maths via the, the lessons and via the assessment then obviously that's going to have a knock-on impact in their life they you know i'm not disputing that um but the likelihood is they're just probably not going to become an accountant yeah. whereas in pe if we're giving them bad experiences and we don't nurture physical literacy in the way it should be, the knock-on effect for that, they, you can be the, the most well-paid accountant in the world, but if your mental health isn't there, it means nothing. If, if, if you don't have this understanding of the benefits of physical activity later in life, it doesn't matter how well-paid you are, it doesn't matter how literate you are, if your physical health isn't with you, it means nothing. And we in PE, have got an opportunity to impact the health 
and well-being and happiness of our students that we teach forever for the it's rest of their life. incredibly exciting. It's incredible. I, I love how you frame things, Lee, because, you know, and I, and I know you've felt a few times recently people haven't got your message and even there's been a little bit of criticism there and what have you, but your message could not be framed more pos positively. Not, it could not be more optimistic, in my opinion. I mean, what you just said there, it literally got me going, you know. It's extreme. I've just written down here, uh, it's a, a core principle to bring our profession together. You know that I mean what a, what a phrase to sort of uh, think about as well now you talked about bad experiences there Lee and I want to sort of link this to that Baumeister research that you so eloquently wrote about Baumeister said bad experiences have far more impact and are processed more thoroughly than good ones these negative impressions are quicker to form and harder to lose okay so that's Baumeister's view why do you consider this to be important in the context of a physical literacy based curriculum and so I refer to it as the hair in the soup mindset yeah. So rest, restaurateurs will, will do all they can, you know, deliver lovely food and, and um, excellent service and do everything they can to make sure that you have a fantastic experience in their restaurant so that you'll come back and, again and again. And you could go back again and again and again because of those experiences. However, all it takes is one, one meal of which you find that hair in the soup and then forever you're experiences of that restaurant are tarnished it could be five five years later a friend says to you should we go to that restaurant oh no i found a hair in my soup it's not you know even if that was just a complete fluke a complete accident i think we need to really understand our impact on a student's experience in physical activity uh, so i remember sorry i'm kind of digressing a bit but you know it's just as we're chatting i kind of remember when i was at primary school and now I'm reflecting on this. It's probably my most vivid memory of primary school. We had this swimming pool. Um, it was an outdoor swimming pool. It would freeze over in the winter. It was never covered. And you'd get into it. Um, I want to say summer, but it was never summer. But you'd get into it. And honestly, it took your breath away. And to this day, I still think about that when I go swimming. Yeah. To the point when I feel cold water, I go back to that six-year-old me that was petrified. I know that the minute I get into that water, I've lost my breath. And for the next 10 seconds, I'm going to be panicking. And I genuinely still think about that to this day. So that negative experience still impacts me when I think about swimming. I still go swimming. I take my kids swimming. They love it. I want to build that positive relationship with swimming. But I, I still have that. And, and in the book, I refer to a 1500 meter lesson where a, um, a, a girl, she was um, she was overweight. She had forgotten her kit on that day. She was what they would call a refuser. Um, but she did it on that day. And it was a, 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 an outside school that I'd been asked to go in and kind of work with a couple of their teachers. And I was, I was honestly, I'd never seen anything like it. They, they were placing all the blame on this kid for refusing. Oh, she hates PE. She, she never does it. She's never got a kit. They, she did do it this day. They gave a kit that was way too small for her. And she's, she was already overweight. So she was humiliated before she even got out to the lesson. And I go into it in a lot more detail in the book. But the long story short was the lesson objective pretty much from what I got was don't stop running. Yeah. If you're going to do 1500 meters, don't stop running. And anytime anybody stopped running, they were hounded. Like almost to the point that it was the really good kids were, were laughing. They weren't challenged on it. And I stood there just, just honestly broken. And this, this girl stopped numerous times, was shouted at, and then would kind of run again a little bit. And that was actually my first experience of this isn't what sport's about. This isn't why we do what we do. And that was actually my first ever experience of, I wonder what, would happen if we reframe this lesson what if the lesson wasn't to complete 1500 meters or what if the lesson objective wasn't you must jog you know never stop running what if the teacher's mindset changed to if a student did stop running we don't say anything when a student then starts running again we praise we say that's brilliant you could have stopped you could have walked the entire way but you didn't and we use that as the positive example not just the people that get in first, second and third. Well done, didn't they do well? The rest of you weren't as good as them, especially the girl that you know is overweight, got really tight clothes on and, and now we're laughing at her. What about if we said to her, every time she started running, that's brilliant, that shows resilience. Then I wonder if we did that and we built that up every single lesson, 
would she then start to think i'll give this a go i don't feel i don't feel like i'm going to be laughed at here and also like consider that girl i i don't know where she is in her life now but i could i could, would hazard a guess that she's probably not regularly phys- physically active it's she's, had, she's had not only that hair in the soup she's had you know the full wig yeah. she's really had a bad experience but physical educators need to understand this nurturing physical literacy means providing positive and meaningful experiences and th- this is how i say it to my staff i say that i don't want us to reward um basically i want us to reframe what we reward i want us to reward attitude and progress yeah. over performance and ability yeah. and and i think it's important that we kind of understand that impact that we have on an experience and the long-term impact that that has being physically active yeah it's, it's fascinating lee and I, I read that i read that um section of the book with real self-identification actually because i can see it in my own lessons as a pe teacher i can see it in the hundreds of PE lessons that i've observed as a as an slt member as a, as a head of department so on and you do see i mean the example you gave yeah. was a was a particularly tough one but you do see it now we're talking about the concept of curriculum we're talking about physical literacy you also reference at the start of this conversation that teachers have got pressure from above they need to assess and they need to make progress that leads to the, the assessment question that you know effectively you know you, you you're writing on assessment in the book you were you were saying that can or can you give the listeners an insight into the importance of what you describe as assessment rubrics and and how you and your team have restructured assessments in corpi to achieve what you describe as holistic and progressive assessments very much framed by what you just described as the progress how do we actually do that out of so there's, there's three areas to a really quality experience in PE curriculum is one yeah um, pedagogy is another we've kind of touched on that with with physical literacy and we touched on the concept curriculum and I'd like to if possible at some point to talk about uh, this idea of a personality pathway because I think the listeners Absolutely. might might be interested in that but the, the idea of assessment is a third piece of our puzzle um, and it, it's really important that we as educators understand the purpose of assessment. Why, why are we assessing? And for far too long, I think assessment has just been about giving a student a grade so that we can report to parents, I can demonstrate progress to, um, to my senior leadership team. And th- which I've never understood because through a sport driven model, you're delivering however many sports across the year, but we're still being able to demonstrate progress. Now, I'm pretty sure that if I was given a badminton unit of work, I'd probably be OK. You put me in a dance unit of work and that progress is probably going to plummet a little bit. So I never understood this idea of progress when we're delivering completely different sports. Um, but we need to understand the purpose of assessment. The purpose of assessment is for us as teachers to understand if what we have taught has been learnt, yeah. do they know what we've been trying to teach them and to frame our future teaching? And for and that, that's not exclusive to teachers. Assessment isn't just for us. It has to be owned by the students as well. The students need to know where they are now, but most importantly, what can I do to improve? Now, I remember when I first came into teaching, our method of assessment and actually that carried on for longer than I would like to, to, to admit was just based on practical ability, yeah. just based on their ability to um, perform these techniques, to ac- accurately replicate these techniques in progressively challenging situations. But the one thing that, that, that now I look back and almost shudder is we had these assessment weeks that were at the end of our unit of work yeah. And we would kind of walk around with a clipboard, clipboard yeah. and kind of judge what we're seeing. And it didn't inform future teaching in any way. The students didn't understand that this was a time of levelling. And actually, even after levels were uh, gone, we were still doing the same. Um, it didn't meet why we assess. It didn't meet the purpose of assessment. The students, some students, we were assessing some students. Um, and I, I think I'm thinking out loud a little bit now, but we were assessing our students on a lesson of javelin that, you know, they might be in year 10. Yeah. They might have had one lesson in year seven, one lesson in year eight, one lesson in year nine. So they've had four lessons over four years. Then we give them a grade for it. And, and, and we all know the nature of a javelin lesson. They've probably thrown the thing six times in an hour. If right. that. So, so 
with that in mind, you know, what's the purpose of your assessment? It's got to be ongoing. So, yeah. so the way in which we, we use it, and this is uh, based on the research actually um, that I, I talk about in the book, but I, my opinion is formative assessment, and this isn't just my opinion. I, I'm, when I say this is my opinion, I've not come up with this. I've, I've taken this from, from others. But formative assessment should inform our summative judgments. And so the idea of going around um, you know, with your clipboard on the final lesson of the week, giving them their, their however they perform in that lesson is their grade is ludicrous. And you know, even as I'm, I shouldn't really admit this, but I'm a Tottenham fan. So if I was to be judging- You definitely shouldn't game, do that. No, I shouldn't. I've just, the book sales have just plummeted. But <laughs> if I was to, to um, you know, look at Harry Kane at the moment, he's going through some poor form. And um, that, that I know, because I've watched him many times, he's an outstanding striker. But at the moment, if I'm watching him, I'm, I'm not thinking that. So if I was to, to summatively assess him just on what I'm seeing right now, his level will be a lot lower but if I was to use my formative observations previously, then his level will be a lot higher. And this idea of, of um, using this rubric, it's all I've shared it in the book. It's in, yeah. You can absolutely take mine, amend it, adapt it, discard it, whatever you want to do. But it's this idea of not just focusing on practical, but looking holistic. What And this is what we spent the most time on, is what do we want our students to leave us knowing? How can we enable the students to own this assessment as much as you know we need it they need it as much it's probably more important to the students and and how can it really meet the purposes of assessment can it inform our future teaching can it give us a good understanding if they've learned what we need them to learn but most importantly do the students know where they are and what they need to do to improve not just on practical ability on character and, and that took us ages, actually. There was loads of toing and froing, and that it was probably one of the most rewarding uh, things that we've done because we really got dug deep into what it is we want our students to know and, and did it meet our why. Okay. And the other thing is, is, and this is what we spent a bit of time doing, is aligning it to our intent. Align, you know, Offset talk about intent, implementation, impact we're aligning it to our intent. There's a lot of people out there, and this isn't wrong, because I love the fact that they're now thinking outside the box and they're, and PE teachers are kind of moving away now from this, this is what we should do. It's almost, almost a middle finger up to those people that are still telling you to assess practically. They're going to the head heart hands, they're going to the me and PE, fantastic models. The only that's, that's, the, the, that's the Frathwell model, isn't it? The head Frathwell heart. is head, heart, hands, yeah, yeah. And, and Bowler is-, is I, I know Andy, he, he was part of my teacher training back in the day. In fact, he's a brilliant guy, and he actually contributed to, to this book and gave yeah, me serious hours of his time. Fantastic guy, mm -hmm. and um, you know, knows loads about it. He's, he's a, a, an absolute guru, and so these models are fantastic. But I think a lot of people are taking you know almost just one size fits all, but yeah. make it bespoke to, to every, the students' needs are different in every school. Your intent is probably different to others, so yeah. just just and I, I think I give some advice in the book of how, how to do that. I, I agree, and it's so comprehensive in the book, what, what you guys have done at UCGS. I mean, you've gone in a lot of detail there, and I, I love that you've just said there, look, take bits of it, take none of it, reject it. It's, it's your call, but please read it. The other thing I wanted to mention there, you, you talked about intent as well, and I think, I, I, think it, it's re, I think it's fair to say that we've all focused on intent because Ofsted have told us to focus on intent, but what you have done is you focused inwardly. You focused on what are we and what are we trying to serve our students? And we can produce any documents we want, but unless we do that, it's unlikely we're going to get it right, in my opinion. And I, and I really yeah. praise you for that. No, you very. Sorry, sorry, go ahead. I just want to interrupt you, James, if I can. So Simon Sinek um, yeah. is a brilliant writer. Um, and I really, I really, his stuff resonates with me. His book of It Starts With Why is why I'm so into sharing my why. I, I read that too. It's brilliant, isn't it? Yeah. And he, he talks about people don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. It's and at the heart um, of my work. It really is, personally. I, I try and share it, myself it changed, all the time. It changed me. It changed what yeah. we, why we do it. And it changed the way I work with my team as well. Um, but it, one thing that, 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 you know, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. We made sure that we over-communicate. And this is some advice, hopefully, to the, those watching that maybe don't do this as much. We over-communicate our intent. So in the book I share, we've got a, a, a mnemonic of deep, 
and that it just links to our intent our four curriculum objectives if you like and we just constantly over communicate it so that now and i think it's probably a little bit of going back to when i went around and asked you know why does p exist at optical grammar school and i got the really generic um answers now you know when i go around i want to hear well it develops our competence and confidence well it educates us all to the value of physical activity That's it amazing. engages us in you know so that it's really important that you over communicate that why to all stakeholders so I, I couldn't agree more. You, you rightly said to me earlier that um, we, we've got to focus on this important aspect, which is the personality pathway as well. And I, I, I would say from my personal perspective is one of my favourite parts of the book. And I would urge PT to have a look at it. But what I'd like you to ask for us is, could, could you give us a background to the personality pathway? And can you explain to us how you've implemented it at UCGS? Because I think as a takeaway for PT, I think this is going to be really valuable. Yeah, uh I really hope so. And I think the concept curriculum, I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of, and I'm proud of the impact it can have, but the personality pathway is something I'm, I'm, I really urge people to go and have a look at. Yeah, we use this, this Sport England research we spoke about previously under the skin as our foundation for this. Yeah. But what was really clear to me early on was that every single student, in fact, scratch that, every single person has a different reason, a different motivation for engaging in physical activity. I know, for example, if it's not competitive, I'm probably not that interested. I want, you know, I love playing tennis. I love playing badminton. But if it's just for a knock around, I'm probably not that bothered. I want to get into a game. I don't necessarily care if I'm playing with my friends. I, I just want to compete. Whereas I also know that my, my girlfriend is somebody that could um, she's really into and she's doing fantastic with it but she she put, will put on like a, a joe wick style hit video and she's into that that is not what would engage me not at all it's really important that we understand that every single human has a different reason for engaging in physical activity and a different attitude and motivation towards physical activity so what we what we did and actually and actually before i get to that before i get into the personality pathway i think what is also really important and i i I'm not going to go into it too much now because I do go into it in quite a lot of detail in the book. But this idea of autonomy, yeah. of student autonomy is it's so, a very strong word in the book. Yeah, it's so important. This idea that um, students have some choice, some control over their learning. And there's evidence, as, as I show in the book, that this um, really supports positive experiences, lifelong positive experiences. And a lot of people um, that have left school talk about um, the, the autonomy being one of the most important things to them when they were at school. So, uh, you know, have a read of that, but definitely, and there's a large thing about human flourishing and one of the big components of human flourishing is autonomy. So giving the students this choice. So what we do is we send out a, uh, a personality questionnaire, all linked to, um, all linked to attitudes and motivations towards sport. And this is this is completely based from. I'm not taking any credit at all. This is completely based from Sport England. Yeah. And this, this uh, is under the skin. Under the skin. This, the, the survey that they used. Yeah. And uh, we had permission by them to, to use it. And we tweaked it, of course, to to fit our our model. And we stick our intent on there, like we do with absolutely everything, to make sure they know what it is. Um, but the students, every single student, completes this, and then they it would then automatically give them a pathway. It's all done in the spreadsheet. And they then just complete a Microsoft form that says, I just got allocated pathway one, two or three. Now, pathway one will be all of our really competitive students. These are the students based on this research. And we've had to tweak it to, to work with us and what we have in our context. So what I'm saying now might not work in your context, might not work in another school, but it is absolutely flexible to be able to, to mould it however you want to use it. And ultimately, the principle behind it is understanding that students have different reasons for participating. So what we then do is put them in their pathways. So if we've got, for example, pathway one will be our really competitive students. They don't care whether they're with their friends. They just want competition. That's what drives them to be physically active. We then got our, our pathway two. Now, these people don't mind competition. It doesn't necessarily drive them, but these people want to be social. They want to be with their friends. And then we have our pathway through uh, three. And please bear in mind, I'm being completely, I'm overlooking quite a lot of detail here, but pathway through the people that are probably actively turned off by competition. Um, 
And these are the people probably most left out of that sport driven uh, curriculum. So then what we do is we put these students in, so I, get, I don't want to call it setting, grouping, if you like, they're that, that's their group. So if you got on this questionnaire pathway one, that's where you go. And we then offer them um, a list of activities and sports, and then they democratically vote on those sports. And this is a work in progress. So we started, we, we, we're trying to deliver this through different models based approaches. Uh, models based practice so we've done sports education game sense we're um, looking at health health based that, all that kind of stuff we're looking we're, it's still a work in progress but ultimately for me and the student voice tells us this our last student voice told us that 93 percent said that the personality pathway has improved their experiences within pe wow and and it is just because we're giving them the choice they're telling us what they're doing we're st it's not recreation we're still there's still educational yeah, value to it absolutely. But, but we're not forcing those students that hate competition to be competitive we're not making those really competitive students to sit through that unit of yoga or, or dance that they they might not enjoy we're, yeah. we're we're making it almost as bespoke as we can do yeah, absolutely. Um, and, it, and it's that and it just goes back to that idea that we, we've got different motivations and attitudes and, and we need to know them well, one of the things I thought was really fascinating, fascinating about the personality pathway is that you don't actually, as you said, they, they effectively de democrat democratically choose four sports. But you, the thing that you allocate is space. It's That's actually right. like the practicalities of where they're going to be is in the field, the gym, the sports or whatever. And, and that I think is interesting because it gives the it not only gives the students autonomy, it gives the teachers autonomy, too. And I feel like the teacher can be really themselves and creative within that environment as well. Yeah, and this is one thing we're working on now with these models based practices is we're introducing teachers to the different ways of delivering yeah. this personality pathway. And then the plan will be that next year the teacher will decide what they believe the model that best suits the, the activity that the, stu the students have chosen, yeah. for example, football just lends itself perfectly to sports education. Yeah. So, so we're just trying to, to build up that knowledge and understanding, but it is very flexible. Um, and that actually there is a number of teachers out there are offering some really fantastic pathways and you know the book i hope it you know that book isn't just written by me that book is written by so many other contributors that are leading outstanding work and i i, I really endorse that lee because you're, you're very you're very modest to say that it is written by you but you're right the second half of the book is case study case study case study case and it, it's presented in a way that it's really digestible in that sense as well i mean i i remember looking at phil maths for example as one that personally stood out to me and i thought was interesting so much so that i'm interviewing phil maths for the podcast next week yeah so it's kind of it's outstanding leading some yeah. fantastic some fantastic work and the international schools yeah and matt, matt bowlers as well is over in wanted that's my first ever teaching job i've met matt a couple of times lovely guy same yeah. same same sort of thing now we're, we're not short on timely but i'm all equally sort of no, aware no. of your time so what what i want to do here is i, I, I want to jump to something and i want to i want to stress and you, you've brought this up numerous times one of the strongest themes in the book and very much from the personality pathway is the importance of learner voice and you repeatedly you were asking the question at the summary of each chapter how do you know how do you how do you know that what you think has happened has actually happened what is the role of students opinions lee and preferences in getting the p offer right and providing autonomy and personalization and what happens if we don't ask students their views i think student voice for me is absolutely vital I, I can't stress that enough especially actually if you're if you're a p now p leader watching this thinking i want to lead change but i've got people in my department that are against it the the student voice there was but the way the way i put it is is there's no going back from awareness the students will absolutely tell you what they think. They will not beat around the bush. If they like what you're doing, they will tell you. If there's things that they um, want differently, they will tell you. If it's not meeting their needs, they will tell you. There is no going back from awareness. Once you're aware, you can't unknow. And if you want to lead change, a student voice is one of the most important ways to do it i remember when i first started in in one school i got told a number of times this is a rugby school this is a rugby school you don't 
what you, I'm looking at your curriculum there. There's not enough rugby in it. You're actually curriculum. You've introduced a different sport other than rugby. And the first thing for me to do was to get out a student voice. And uh, they were very traditional. They wanted just sport driven stuff. And I knew that that wasn't me. And I knew that I was going to have an uphill battle and they were, uh, they made it known. And so student voice for me was probably one of the biggest ways of showing them without me saying you're wrong. It's one of the biggest ways of saying, oh, I'm afraid you're wrong, or, or this is what the students are telling us. They're not lying. I'm not lying. It's there in black and white. And as I go back, you know, there is no going back from awareness. Once you know it, well, okay, so you're, okay, so you're telling me this isn't a rugby school, that the students aren't enjoying their rugby lessons. Um, there's no going back from that. So it, it really is sometimes the catalyst for meaningful change. And, um, but also it's, it's a way of, of just, just tapping in a little pulse survey, just, just knowing, are we on the right track? Can you help us? Can you guide us here? Or, um, so we knew that the concept driven curriculum, for example, um, with some of our more sports enthusiastic kids, um, we, we needed to use student voice to, to really make sure that the, the sports that we delivered with the concept curriculum were what the students wanted. For extracurricular sport as well, I, I couldn't imagine ever delivering an extracurricular programme that wasn't led by what the students have told us. Yeah. You know, what, what days work best for you? Does a lunchtime session work better than an after school session? Do you enjoy competition what why do you come what's a, what's your barriers to, to coming to an extracurricular session it just tells you everything you, you need to know and, and as i say it's a catalyst for change um and, and it just really enables you to know if you're nurturing physical literacy if what you're doing is working and and if not let, let's let's reflect and, and i think sorry i know you're, you 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 want to say no, no, you're fine waffle james so do oh, mate you <laughs> listen i could listen to you all daily i mean I don't, i'm not sure you're realizing how valuable this is it, oh, well, please I'm, don't I'm, feel pressured uh, my, my my pressure simply coming from make getting you back to your family not zero yeah, nothing else. kids up in a couple of minutes but um i think with student student voice it's um really important for, for change and etc et but don't take it personally i agree it's not a personal attack on you and it can be seen that way i know i my first one i felt that way so you know i tried really hard with this curriculum you're telling me you don't like it well it's your fault not mine yeah but you can't look at it that way you've got to look at it constructively and see right well this is some really useful information Let, what can we do with that Absolutely brilliant. And you, you touched on extracurricular there as well. One of the things we were going to talk about tonight was, and I know you feel strongly about this, is like we're not talking about removing extracurricular. We're not talking about removing sport and teams and competition from extracurricular. That can be part of bespoke, but it can't be just that. We need to have something that offers health, engagement, fitness, and the ways that, as you said with the learner voice, the students actually want to approach it. And I, I utterly endorse you uh, on that one. And Lee, I, I kind of want to come to a final question here. And it, it, in some way, it's a bit twee and a bit um, a bit cliche, but I want to ask you the question, Lee, is PE today in crisis? And if fundamental change is indeed necessary, what does success look like in the coming years? It's a good question. And at one time, my view of PE, and this is very selfish, but my world that I was living in in PE was in crisis. That doesn't mean that the subject as a whole was, but my, the you know, in fact, I nearly left. For me, it was. I was thinking this isn't making uh, any, any impact. Then I spoke to practitioners. I spoke to physical educators. I reflected. And, and honestly, James, you'll know as well as I will, there are some outstanding practitioners out there genuinely PE teachers are amazing they're so so unbelievable some of the change that's going on right now leading that change and against against the pressures from the top and the fact that a lot of this work doesn't exist they're going out and doing it themselves is just outstanding i try and share as much of that as, as i can but it's impossible to do but speaking to those people being inspired by these people implementing it in my school seeing the impact it's having no PE is in crisis but that doesn't mean that we're where we need to be yeah. it's, it's not valued by everybody at the moment if we're being completely honest we are seeing those societal issues that we spoke about earlier we are seeing lessons being taken away that we haven't won everyone over we haven't even won the majority over probably so there's a huge amount of work to do um 
and the one thing I'm just really kind of you know buoyed by is is that there are so many schools now that are open to change my twitter is constantly um it, you know the messages coming into my twitter saying like, can i just ask you this question can i ask you that question would you mind coming to work with us for a little bit i'm just really um, happy about that because it just it shows that people are saying not not it doesn't i don't care if you agree with me of course i care if you agree with me but uh, it's more about that idea of being open. Uh, you know, there's other ways of doing things. And I think to come back to your question, um, success, what does success look like? I think success is PE holding its rightful place at the heart of every curriculum. It, it's, it's, it's it being valued by everyone and it's creating lifelong engagement in physical activity it's providing relevant and meaningful learning and i'll stop there but it, it, it's just pe should be in my opinion and i know in yours and i know in so many listening the heart of every single curriculum and that's where it should be and and hopefully with with some of the changes happening and some of the outstanding leaders that we have in pe that is exactly where it's going just brilliantly and, and you you should never stop you should never stop talking i mean the way you are i cannot praise you enough this i already see this buckley that this, this, yes it's a book yes it, it's a comment but that's not what this is about this is about you and your belief and you sharing and i and i, and I really want to thank you as well for not giving up because you know clearly at the start of this conversation you, you've been very candid there there were times in the past where you were probably on the edge of not doing this anymore. And thank God you didn't change. Now, I don't know what well, you, maybe you would have gone and been an astronaut. I don't know, but, but, but nevertheless, I think we in the sector should be very, very grateful that not only did you stick, yeah, but you stuck, you reflected and you, and you've written this and I cannot endorse this enough as a read. I think you're absolutely rightly. People will take different things from different parts of it. I know what mine are, but guys, it is, you need to go and get this book. People need to take this on and they need to read it. I, I literally sat down and read it in three sins. Not, no one, you don't have to do that, but that's where it's going to grab you. So go and get yourself a copy. The end of the story. Absolutely right. Feel free. I mean, hopefully podcasts like this will continue to, to help people, but mm. feel free to, to direct message me on Twitter. Yeah. Feel free to, to, to contact me and ask for help. I, I, you know, I'm really open to, to supporting you however I can. So the, the book isn't the end of it. And and James, thank you very much as well for what you're doing. Let's, let's not, you know, be too humble. The stuff you did over lockdown, making you, you, your website free to people, the stuff you're doing now, bridging that gap. There's, there's some great people out there uh, and you're, you're, you're one of them. So thank you very much as well. Thank you, mate. And look, it's, it's been an absolute privilege. We'll get you, we'll get you off to your family now. Go and do your, you we're, we're recording this on a Friday afternoon. It's the weekend. Thank you so much, Lee. Yeah, Thank take you. care, guys. Thank you very much.